Hi everybody and welcome. Good evening, good afternoon. Uh, I guess it could be morning for some people, so good morning to you as well. And welcome to the penultimate webinar in our um, occupant-centric simulation-aided building design series. It's been a fascinating tour of a really important subject and I'm delighted this evening um, to introduce Julia Day and Philip Agui, who are going to be uh, talking about human building interfaces, design and considerations for simulation. This webinar, uh, like all of the webinars that we do, is part of the mission of the IBIPSA Education Committee. And we exist to identify education and training needs throughout the building simulation performance community. And that's very broadly defined, um, whether you use simulation as a tool in your work, um, either in industry, uh, potentially in government, or whether you are a researcher, even developing the tools, um, it, you're all part of our community. Um, and we initiate and encourage other people as well to develop new materials. So if you have something that you are interested in sharing with the community as a whole, then do please get in touch. A key part of what we do is that to ensure that our training sessions are open to non-members as well as to members to really uh, make sure we increase the impact. So in a minute, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'll ask Julia to, to share hers and to start the presentation. Um, as we go through, if you've got any questions, please do pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Once Julia and Philip have finished their presentation, then I'll put the questions to them. So it's a fascinating topic, so I'm sure you'll have uh, lots of thoughts on that. We've had some really excellent questions lately. Um, so, Julia, Philip, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for hyping up our our topic. <laughs> we had fun um, working on this book and uh, working with the team, and um, we're excited. So, um, should we do some quick introductions yeah. and then move from there? Okay. So, um, Philip, I'll actually let you go ahead and start. Put you on the spot there. <laughs> the quick sure. intro. Hello, I'm uh, Philip Agee. I'm a assistant professor in the Myers Lawson School of Construction at Virginia Tech. And I work on a lot of uh, my background is in industrial and systems engineering, specifically human factors and applied building science. Awesome, thank you. And I'm Julia Day, I'm associate professor at the School of Design and Construction at Washington, Washington State University and director of the Integrated Design and Construction Lab. And uh, my background's actually in interior design and construction management. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with our IEA um, annex groups um, the last 10 years or so. And this topic of building interfaces and interactions with building interfaces has really started to um, become more and more important. And what I loved about this project and this chapter in particular is we had a lot of different disciplines working on this topic and talking through um, some of kind of the fundamental research and human building interaction, which Philip brings a lot of that good stuff to the table. Um, I'm able to use a bit of my interior design kind of psychology background and then um, other folks um, that you see here listed as chapter authors. Um, a lot of them are coming from a kind of an engineering perspective. So bringing that all together has been uh, been really important for what we're what we're doing. So with that, a quick overview of what we'll tackle in the presentation. So um, first we'll we'll define building interfaces and what we what we mean when we say that. Um, sometimes it's common depending on what discipline you're in, and other disciplines it might not be at all. Um, we'll talk about modeling occupant behaviors a bit and kind of different approaches to that. And then the challenges that exist in trying to simulate um, building interfaces and particularly building interface uh, interactions. And then we conclude some future research recommendations. So just uh, really quickly, so that we're all on the same page and starting from the same place. When we're trying to understand um, energy in buildings, energy use, um, even health or indoor environmental quality kind of outcomes. It's really important to understand 
how people are interacting with the building and what they're actually able to interact with. So when we talk about building interfaces, um, a few kind of terms here. So when we say building occupants, um, they might be called uh, humans, which they are, <laughs> I hope in all cases, uh, tenants, you know, users, depending on what kind of literature you're looking at, um, there might be different ways that um, building occupants are referred to, but throughout um, our chapter, we try to keep it pretty consistent. Um, those are the folks who are working or living in those buildings and interacting with building interfaces. So when we talk about building interfaces, we're talking about those systems or building controls where people can actually interface or touch different aspects of the building and change something. So it could be doors, it could be blinds, light switches, thermostats, and so on. Um, so those interaction examples, again, um, those are going to vary based on several factors that we will talk about soon. So one question I always get asked is, well, if we can't simulate these interactions adequately, because um, it is a bit hard to model these, um, why are we even letting people touch the building in the first place? Like, wouldn't we reach our energy goals if people could you know, just go about their business and not touch a thermostat and not touch a light switch. And there's, I think, a, a large group of folks who are team automation and they want to automate everything. Um, my response is this. <laughs> I've seen in a lot of different buildings, um, a lot of creative occupants will do things to those building interfaces to, you um, take control back over because people ultimately want control. So trash bags and air vents. Um, my favorite is the top right that um, is not an original image. That one's from Google, but I've seen several versions of this where um, if people can't actually access the thermostat, they might put popsicles on it um, to trick it into thinking that it's colder than it is. Um, conversely, I did a study once where um, someone was shining a quarter at the thermostat and directing the sun and the radiation towards it so that he could kick on the air conditioning and they couldn't figure out why they weren't meeting their energy goals. And that was why. So you can simulate that all you want, but if you have people doing really creative things in your building um, to stop you, then it's not going to work. And then over here we have a, a taped, um, you know, occupant control our um, sensor, occupancy sensor for lighting and so on. So this is my reason <laughs> and my answer to why we don't automate everything. Um, I think there's there's a great way to sort of blend manual and automatic control and hopefully better understand these building interactions so that we can have models that are actually more representative of what might actually happen in a building. So um, now that we've defined those human building interfaces and um, hopefully given you the, the rationale for why um, simulations might not match up with actual use. Um, I think it's important that we lay the foundation for some important um, human building interaction research. And so Philip's gonna go into that in more detail here in just a minute. Um, but just big picture, human building interaction, or you may have heard HBI, that is really, um, a large discipline of research that's really focused on how people interact with the built environment. And um, there's a lot of UX or user interface research that's um, in that body of work as well. And um, it's really, really important for understanding why somebody, you know, someone might put a control in a building and expect it to be used one way and realize later that it wasn't used that way. And this kind of research helps us understand where some of those barriers to um, that interaction might exist. So um, HBI is also helpful in uh, understanding overall building of performance, um, especially in terms of energy use, the overall occupant experience, indoor environmental qualities and comfort, for instance, and health. So if we can better understand human building interactions and which ones are needed, then we can understand how to select better interfaces for those interactions, um, which kind of moves into 
you know, looking at different types of emerging technologies, for instance, and different types of interfaces, different groups of people, climates, types of buildings, and so on, might have different interactions, expectations, and um, different ways in which they'll use those interfaces. And by using HBI and pulling from a lot of other disciplines, we can, we're really starting to get a better understanding of um, how this works. And by understanding more and more research and doing more things like um, Philip's doing a lot of great field research and um, lab work looking at um, how people perceive and use those interfaces, we can then understand that and take it into our simulation models. So just really quickly here, um, this diagram um, initially came from a paper back in 2020 that I'm happy to share the link with later. Um, but I think it's it's fairly well known that you might have an interface. Um, let's say this is a thermostat in this example. Um, there's some kind of control logic actuator and then the end use or kind of end result of what happens from that control and feedback from point to point. So there's a lot of different factors that are going to influence um, why that interaction happens. And so I, I feel like simulation has this part of the puzzle, um, has a better better grasp on this. Is We have a thermostat, we have someone interacting with that thermostat, and then we can expect that the end result or end energy use will be X, Y, or Z. What's less known is, now we've expanded this diagram, is this chunk on the left. So there are a lot of different user motivations for interacting with an interface. And then are they capable or able, or do they have the opportunity to interact with that interface? Do they understand it? What is the context of that interaction and so on, that it's really hard to understand when that interface might actually be used based on what's going on um, inside that particular individual. So the integration of this entire loop um, and feedback back to the user is important as well. And I think Philip will talk a bit more about this as well. So to pull all of that together here really quickly, building interface, we're looking at different systems, components, controls in the building, whether that's intentional or unintentional, um, where folks can interact with the building and its various subsystems. Why does it matter? Um, because we interact with our buildings every day, um, how often we interact and in what context and so on, all of those things will impact both human performance and energy performance. The context will definitely matter. Um, for instance, if we have residential or commercial, the drivers of behavior and the psychology that goes into that is going to change as well. And again, human factors, um, trying to understand the actual characteristics and design of those user interfaces. Um, do we have a lot of contrast? What is the size? Can people actually understand what's going on? Um, the actual design of the interface itself is going to limit or enable um, interactions. So there's, there's a lot of things going on here and um, hopefully we'll tackle some of these for you. So I'll hand this over to Philip. And Great. we'll talk about the the key kind of theories and models. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, and it's uh, for those of you on on the on the webinar, um, you might have some answers or some some key thoughts about this and uh, and how to make and improve some of the tools we have out there, uh, because it's probably only going to get harder, right? As Julia was kind of pointing out uh, in the last slide, most of our you know, some of you might be thinking, well, what we're talking about is building controls, right? And in some level, yes. And right now they manifest typically uh, as a visual display, but in the future, you know, instead of it being a, just a fixed visual display, like a thermostat on the wall, now we have um, thermostat apps that we can control uh, remotely. Um, increasingly we have uh, auditory displays like, like uh, where we can actually vocalize what we want to change, right? So that the complexity and the level of potential uncertainty there is gonna is gonna continue to grow, right? So I I guess that's the pitch to su to suggest that it might get harder before it gets easier. 
And so my journey on this has been, you know, I was an, uh, I jokingly call myself a recovering energy modeler and mechanical designer. And so when, if you think about the way that most mechanical systems are designed is the controls that come with the systems are just, you know, they're by the manufacturer, whatever system you, the engineer selects, that's the controls they're getting. And so as you get into other kind of the way we approach other product design, typically, you know, it's the opposite of that. We look at the interfaces, the shared boundary between the people and the system, and then we try to, to make that a good interaction or a good kind of interface. So some fundamental models that, that we use to understand this is, is around um, human information processing, We'll talk about the technology acceptance model and some some research. And then there's absolutely uh, some of y'all might already be thinking about there's there's absolutely an element of the way that we design buildings and uh, building systems and building controls and interfaces that might need to change in order for us to kind of do a better job of, of simulating this in the future. OK, I think you can move on to the next one. So the first model that we, you know, I like to joke a lot that uh, this, a lot of the best ideas are borrowed, right? And so, um, and, you know, coming out of the kind of energy and, and kind of built environment world, I, I did my PhD in, in industrial and systems engineering and human factors and human information uh, processing is, is just a seminal model to understand the way that humans perceive information. So imagine the context of a, a user interacting with a building interface where you have uh, some type of maybe visual stimuli that's perceived in the human sensory system. Um, and it's, you know, we have attentional resources that are dynamic, right? So early in the morning when you've had your coffee and you're raring to go, right, you ha might have more attention to devote to your perception and your decision and response selection versus at say the end of the day, right? Or maybe right before you're going to bed. So it's a recognition that, that um, you know, humans, the, the dynamic nature of human information processing and how that can influence uh, the way that we design controls or interfaces with uh, icons or spatially uh, in the display. Um, and, and you see this kind of, uh, really emerge in the way that say websites are designed. You notice that like if you pull up a Google uh, Google Chrome page and the search query for Google is just a, you know, the only, there's very little visual clutter. There's just a little search query right there, right? So they're, they recognize that there's not all sorts of information that gets in the way that would impact uh, your ability to uh, retrieve information from your memory and then make a, a response selection. Okay, we can go to the next one. So the next important uh, kind of model that we use uh, in, in the chapter was uh, that really ties into what Julie was outlining earlier, which is around thinking about not just solving for the most efficient building um, or this very technology centered approach, but thinking about the overall user experience, right? Not thinking about it in terms of purely occupant behavior, which is stochastic. We can't control it and kind of throw our hands up in the air. And, you know, I used to be one of those people that would say, you know, take the buildings out and we'll make a super efficient building. Um, but, you know, in, in, other, in other complex systems, we think about user experience and technology acceptance model, uh, which has been around for a while, really just um, you know, allows us to think about and predict users' behavior by their intention of use with the technology. So effectively, if you have a, a, a system that's easy to understand and use, we can um, be more confident that people are actually going to interact with it the way that we think they will. Versus if you have a more complex system and the people don't perceive them to be useful, uh, they're not going to. So classic example, we just recently completed a study that's under review right now where we, or we, my PhD student, let it we download. We looked at con residential connected thermostats and downloaded 130,000 Amazon and App Store reviews. And most people in the energy kind of engineering world, like that, you know, we spend a lot of time in. They think about connected thermostats as a benefit to, uh, you know, uh, dealing with energy efficiency or shaving peak demand, right? Well, out of these reviews, we did a kind of looking at the, the, the user reviews, the number one issue that people cared about in those reviews was how usable the interface was, right? They, they talked about being able, they preferred to change their thermostat on their phone rather than changing it on the wall, right? And th at the same time, the level of energy efficiency that, that the thermostat that most manufacturers and most energy nerds like myself care about, that was not emergent in the data at all. So in some ways, it's kind of a misalignment between what we think the product is there for versus what people who actually use the technology, um, you know, we can we need those insights to, to do a better job in the future. Okay. 
Okay, so how do we how do people interact with buildings? And um, and again, I think that's the most one of the key takeaways is is not just thinking about in terms of occupant behavior, but in fact of, of an interaction. We have a whole palette of methodologies that we can look at and other uh, that we can borrow to understand these interactions. So we can go to the next slide. And so this is how we're kind of building on the work that Julia led is how do we kind of um, integrate some of these kind of models and theories from uh, human system interaction and integration that are common in aerospace or transportation um, into kind of the built environment. So effectively, we're saying, yeah, let's look at the classic kind of building interfaces around thermostats, lighting controls, energy management systems, maybe indoor air quality uh, type of, uh, you know, uh, displays and things like that, and then borrow these methods and, and frameworks. And so I'll just show you an example. And this is not energy related, but it was it was convenient. So we had uh, just uh, but it shows you the level of uh, variability in the way that may, people might interact. So we're uh, looking at the differences between single flush and dual flush toilets, right? So I think everybody on the call would agree that saving water is important. And the whole development of dual flush toilets, right? Uh, you know, smaller volumes of water when you need less water and, you know, larger volumes of water when you need more water, right? So that that's a very technology centered approach uh, to thinking about a control interface. So what you're seeing here is we actually ran, we, we ran down about, I think 25 or 30 different um, flush controllers, uh, both single and dual flush. And then we used an eye tracker and ran human participants and asked them, what would you push for a one? What would you push for a two? And what you're seeing on the left is a single flush um, flusher where in the eye gaze from the eye tracker that the participant is wearing, and it was 100% success, right? And then you see this common kind of in the middle, um, this dual flush controller, and you see the kind of eye gaze floating back and forth. And so, and then on the right, you see another example where we use actual icons um, in the control interface. And still, I mean, we asked them to, to use a single flush, right? Or dual flush. And so there, there's just spread there, there's uncertainty. The point being that uh, this is an interaction that happens multiple times a day with every occupant or every user in industrialized society. And so the more buttons, um, and I think we can go to the next one, uh, the more challenging it might be. So this is uh, just another kind of example of the way we're using these HIP models or technology acceptance models. So of those 57 or so connected thermostats out there that are available for residential buildings, connected being there's a, a fixed visual display on the wall, and then there's a corresponding app. Um, there are close to 30 different ways to adjust the temperature just on the fixed visual display, right? So if you were, the, the lack of standardization makes um, our job, your job as experts in simulation, right? That, that, that introduces a significant amount of uncertainty into the potential interactions that a user can have with a discrete interface, okay? So, so yeah. And so, and it's not just thermostats, right? And they're not just, uh, you know, we can have different, you can just see the, you know, wayfinding um, blinds, different types of thermostats, lighting controllers seems to be now more troublesome than they used to be a few years ago. So at this point, I'm going to hand it back off to Julia. Awesome. Thank you. So yeah, we, uh, we actually did a study a few years ago where we cataloged all these different types of interfaces and similar to this um, previous slide, where you're looking at all the different controls on um, actual, like I guess, digital controls or interfaces. If you even just think about windows um, and blinds and and so on, there's there's so many different ways. Um, especially if you travel to another country, you might have something that's a bit unfamiliar and not as intuitive. Um, so it's just there's the drivers of behavior themselves. And then um, like Philip was saying, there's so many different ways we might interact based on if we actually understand that interface or not. So really we think the key to understanding those human building interactions is to balance those needs of the occupants with the efficiency of the building. And I think one way you can do that is actually design an interface that makes a lot of sense. And when you're designing the building, select the appropriate types of interfaces. So we'll give you a couple of examples of what, what that means. So um, a lot of this work has come a long way, I would say in the last five, 10 years, but 
really one of the bigger gaps still is um, simulating those occupant behaviors. And um, I think a key to unlocking that is to better understand different interface and occupant interactions, but also have a bit more standardization um, in that as well, which we'll talk about shortly. So just a few additional models that um, we talked about in the chapter to help understand this. And um, this particular model is adapted from an ISO standard and looking at different ways that we might be able to design and evaluate the design um, of an interface, for instance. So um, first step would be understand and specify the context of use. So what kind of user do you have? Do you, um, is it visual, auditory, both, and so on? Step two would be to specify those user requirements and um, really understand the user needs. I've seen a lot of interfaces fail because the designer didn't understand who was actually using that building and um, when they would use different interfaces or controls. Step three would be produ producing those different design solutions that meet those use requirements. And then for evaluating that, and then it's kind of this loop because every time you do something, especially um, as designers, architects, you might have this post-occupancy evaluation stage even where you find that something's not quite working um, for, because of something you didn't think about. And so it's just this continual kind of design process and learning as well. So one example, just a pretty basic example to, to show how this particular model might be used in the real life or in the real world is um, lighting response. So um, I worked on a project, oh boy, 10 years ago now, <laughs> it's a long time ago, where we were um, working with a utility company and um, looking at different standards for interface selection for different lighting response. So a lot of this um, was in conjunction with the energy code changes. So was it a dimming switch? Was there um, a buy, try, multi-level switching um, option on that switch? Different types of occupancy control sensors, and then daylight aperture, were there, was it side lighting or top lighting? And then if there was a daylight sensor or photo cell, um, was that open loop or closed loop? So we were able to design this little tool where you looked at different um, space types, and then you can put as a best practice, you know, a, as a plus there, a good option as a check, and really like not typical or recommended um, is the, the red dash there. And so you can kind of think about this idea of, you know, I have different users and different space types potentially, um, and just for this one interface type, for lighting, I can quickly start to understand kind of the use needs, context of use, and different controls that I might select based on those user requirements. Um, so doing more kind of exercises, exercises like this in the design process, I think is really important to make sure you're not, um, you know, I've, I've seen some folks just copy and paste old specifications over from another building, and that might not work based on the context of what you're trying to do. So again, just really important to understand those different programmatic requirements and elements. You know, are occupants expected to interact with that interface? What types of interactions will they have and how many, how often? Um, looking at different types of goals. So are we looking at energy savings or occupant health and comfort or both? And how do we then balance those? So one example could be, um, providing some manual control in terms of health and comfort, but maybe it has some kind of bounds where it doesn't go too high or too low for the energy savings piece of that. Um, and then once you've kind of worked through all those programmatic questions, which types of interfaces and selections are going to support those goals? So Great. I'm gonna pass this back over to Philip. Great, so thanks, Julia. So yeah, can we simulate these interactions with complex systems and again, you know, when I was in, doing my PhD, I, you know, I had lots of colleagues that were working with Boeing where they're simulating interactions with users in cockpits of airplanes, right? Or, or they're working for Jaguar doing the same thing with, uh, with vehicles. So they're not necessarily interested in how much gas is being saved, 
right? And I think that's something that's contextually different in uh, the other types of simulation uh, kind of context than in buildings. Oftentimes we're, we're trying to make the buildings as efficient as possible, or we're trying to understand thermal comfort or something like that. It's not really around understanding the user side of it as much. So we can check out some relevant standards on the next slide. Um, and yeah, right now there's, there's currently no building interface standard out there. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if you were con to compare this to say the, the, uh, the automobile industry with ISO 7000, every vehicle that you get in that, that follows a standard is going to have the same high beam, the same hazard, the same windshield wiper, uh, type of icons, right? So again, now we're going from those 30 different ways to change the thermostats to one way to change the thermostat, right? I think that from, uh, again, some of you on, on this webinar probably have deeper expertise on building simulation tools, right? But I would, I would expect that that would, that would be a good thing from at least reducing the potential uncertainty for how people are having these discrete interactions. Of course, there's some other uh, types of standards out there that we can borrow from when we're looking at maybe, and, and that's what Julie and I, a small group, are probably motivated to work on the next four or five years is how do we get some, um, some standardization on the icons and control interactions. So we can go to the next slide. But of course, there are existing simulation tools out there that already do account for uh, really types of building controls. Um, you know, it's kind of a gap now, but you know, we for, we do have simul very simple simulations that have set points that are maybe kind of deterministic models. Um, but it doesn't com it doesn't account for the complexity of these user interactions, or do people even understand this? So, you know, we don't have. Uh, just that that additional variability of adding in additional modalities, right? Like not, you know, when this image was taken from this simula simple simulation tool, there were no app-based thermostats. There were no voice-based thermostats, right? So uh, we just like to think about it across the way the simulator versus, um, you know, the actual user view might contextualize the interaction. So we can go to the next one. So uh, this is another good idea to borrow from other places, right? So in the building industry, uh, we have a tendency to think about automation from a technology uh, perspective and it's oversimplified. It's either automated or not automated. Um, and in other complex systems, uh, we have really an under a deeper understanding that really we use automation in multiple steps. So either human dominated uh, or all the way through uh, fully autonomous, right? And in the automotive industry, we have standards like SAE J3016 that define the levels of, of automated driving. And we probably need to work towards that in the built environment. And there's like a group, Passive Logic, that's been pushing this. Um, if anybody on the call knows Troy, he's been singing this for, for years, right? But right now, we just kind of do a current, we, we do what's called a leftover approach. We just we just give the occupants what's ever left over. And so we, we demonstrate this as an example on the right, if this is maybe a little bit uh, kind of abstract to you. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so challenges with in court that we see, you all might have a different perspective or a, a, a deeper perspective on this, but right now we have oversimplified assumptions. We have a, a lack of specific tenant data, or some of you all might be thinking, well, yeah, we built designed the building for one use and then it gets changed down the road, right? That's absolutely uh, uncertainty there. Compliance driven requirements, right, with codes. Um, we have kind of ignoring the role of interfaces and, and, you know, really a lot of times we think about them as a way to just do basic manipulations or uh, basic system control functions. But a lot of times people are motivated to use these controls or systems because it makes their life easier, right? I want to lay in the bed and adjust my thermostat. Um, we have definitely some, some limitations on the way it might be uh, represented as static occupant behaviors and, you know, uh, hey, as faculty, our behaviors are probably different in the summer than they are during the school year. And then we have integration challenges, right? So as we dive deeper, um, it might be harder to generalize some of these discrete interactions. Okay, so I'm not going to spend much time on this because you all probably have really deep understanding on this, but we have three types of occupant models in the interface context. Uh, each are, you know, differing levels of usefulness. And we have deterministic, probabilistic, and agent-based. I would hypothesize that agent-based is where most of the action is going to happen in the interface stimulation work in the future. And we can move on. And then we have a, what we do know that we can do is we can use behaviors as inputs. Uh, we can use interfaces from a control logic standpoint. And then we can also try to, we can also integrate feedback as outputs and um, building performance simulations. 
And I'll, we'll just wrap up here with a, a quick case study that we included in the chapter from one of the co-authors where they wanted to look at the impact of lighting interface design uh, and controlled logic. So we had kind of three options. We had the, the classic manual, you know, uh, the binary choice, manual on, manual off. You literally physically flip the switch. Then we had a manual on vacancy off. And then we had what would be really kind of considered fully automated, which is occupancy on, occupancy off. And so just some quick um, results from this. So the, the, the chart on the left is uh, the output relating to energy use with the three options there on the x-axis. And you can see that effectively the really the hybrid option in the middle, which was manual, you turn the light on, but then there's an automatic off, was the most energy efficient uh, control scheme. And then what's really in the least energy efficient uh, control scheme was the fully automated or the automatic on, automatic, automatic off. And then what's just another last point to point you to here on this slide is effectively the number of uh, interactions that are occurring with these different approaches, right? So what you see probably there in the top right is some false on and offs, right? Or maybe just somebody walking through. Uh, and if you worked around building performance a while, particularly in commercial buildings, you're probably used to hearing stories about supply diffusers being too close to lighting sensors and turning on uh you know turning on and uh tripping on the light sensors and things like that but i think that the key points are there's this balance between how the interaction happens the level of automation and, and the actual outcomes from an energy performance standpoint you go to the next slide and i think we'll just yeah so this little just brief case study that was done by uh one of the co-authors that illustrates how subtle these the and the nuances around the interface control decisions can have on actual building performance and, uh, but we, then there's also this need, right, to, and anybody in the simulation world, I hope would uh, already be singing this, this song would be, there's a real need to, to validate these assumptions that we make in the simulations with real world data. And if you want to look, there's, there's a link to the paper that, that dives into a little deeper, as well as in the chapter, we talk about it. Okay, so recommendations for future work, right? What Julie and I and our team are working on in the future. So we want to learn from other domains uh, in, in kind of the interface simulation. So in auto, uh, automobiles and transportation, um, you know, we need to develop some higher fidelity approaches to these modeling interface interactions. And then of course we need to validate the simulations with, with real data. And that's what we're doing a lot here with my team at Virginia Tech. And then account for these, inter, um, account for the interfaces, try to think about which which interfaces, sometimes as researchers, we're, we're lazy and we, we work on convenient data, but like try to think about the, the interactions that happen the most with the most people. Uh, and then we need to develop some experimental designs. And then also we're, we're interested in how you could maybe use some uh, kind of borrow some, some ideas from behavioral economics with things like nudges or, you know, uh, kind of defaults or choice architecture. Okay, so just to wrap it all up here before we hopefully have some questions or discussion. So uh, building interfaces, design considerations for simulation. So humans interact with buildings and their subsystems, absolutely. And these interactions occur at the building interface or really the shared boundary between the people and the technology. And right now those are emergent really as predominantly as visual and or haptic responses or interactions. Increasingly, they're gonna be auditory, maybe even gesture based, right? Um, so there'll be no lack of opportunity there to explore this stuff. There's really a lack of standardization out there, which is, you know, probably needs to be worked on here immediately. And our, our, our current approaches don't accurately represent the complexity of these interactions um, and uh, adding additional modalities and, um, as the complexity and uncertainty to these simulations. So I think that's it. We'd be happy to take any comments, questions, discussion points. Thank you. That was fascinating. I didn't expect to be talking about toilets so much in <laughs> one of these webinars. <laughs> so that was a first. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Uh, do please pop them into the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. Um, I had one to start with. Um, I just wonder, um, how you see things changing over time. One of the things about buildings that is perhaps different to um, to some of the other things like um, automotive um, sector is that the you know they stay around for a long time and bits get changed. So you might you can end up potentially with control systems, um, not just with the building itself 
having a different function, but zoning might be different, systems might be different. Um, and how do you see that panning out? Do you think that the that technology can cope with with that degree of change? I have a couple thoughts, and I'm, Philip might as well. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, thanks. So one way that I think we should address that, um, and this is sort of it. Um, it's answering a component of your question, I guess. But when something I've been starting to really think about the last couple of years is this idea of resilient interfaces, and you know what are the characteristics of those? So not only with buildings changing over time and different occupants and things like that, but um, in the event that there's a natural disaster, for instance, um, I think it would we would be doing people a disservice if the building was overly automated and now I need to get fresh air and I can't open my window anymore, which has happened here. Um, and I think in Europe, there's quite a lot more operable windows than there are in the U S and hopefully that's starting to shift a bit. But, um, one example that I've used before is after hurricane Katrina in new Orleans, um, people were having to throw chairs out of their windows to break the glass, to get fresh air that is a bad interface. <laughs> so um, I think that we should design interfaces, not only in a way that people understand them, but in a way that they can be useful and adapt through time in different circumstances. You know, we, we dealt with different HVAC issues and air quality concerns with COVID. Um, here in Washington state, we have a lot of wildfires and I can't open the window, but it might be hot. So so then what do you do? So there's, I think in the future going to be a lot more of those kinds of um, issues where you have to kind of pick either or in terms of energy or comfort or health. And um, it's going to be even more important to have some kind of standardization, standardization, but also resilience kind of mapped out in those as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, I think that's really interesting, but it's also interesting that buildings are complex systems, I think. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about how interfaces can help people interact with the whole system rather than just one component part of it. Um, yeah. It's it's going to be hard, right? And, and uh, I will say that uh, I think we're going to need everybody, but we're going to need manufacturers to get on. And, and it's going to be easier than making uh, major enclosure changes, right? And so some of the challenges we face right now with specific manufacturers, let's just talk thermostats, right? Because that's pretty relatable. The best, you, the best thermostat, like I can, we have thermostats manufacturers out there that put seven day forecasts in the, in, in their interface. And I can imagine the, the engineers that sat around the table that thought that that was a good idea, but that's a terrible idea. Nobody, nobody gets their seven day forecast from, from their thermostat, right? So some of the challenges we need to bring manufacturers in and have like kind of more interoperable systems because the best, more, most user-friendly thermostats, these manufacturers, um, they write proprietary algorithms and controls. So the best user-friendly thermostats don't work with their equipment. So, you know, inverter-driven heat pumps that we all want, right? Um, they're very, very um, siloed and they don't want, you know, they have terrible control and in, um, interfaces for the most part. I don't mind saying that. Um, we need them to be more involved. So these things can be swapped out and just be easier. And it's going to be much easier than the building enclosure stuff. So I think I'm optimistic, um, but we need more people to get involved. Yep. Yep. I think that's, uh, yeah, a great invitation uh, to the field <laughs> to, to get involved. Um, the, the other thing that I had been wondering about, um, I'd, it was really striking the the example you showed um, with the difference between in energy consumption between the um, the fully automated and either the the manual or, or the manual with uh, the manual on and an automatic off, um, and it made me wonder uh, how much that is due to uh, a, a sort of a much wider tolerance band um, when you have a degree of control. Um, the, the range of, of lighting um, that you're prepared to live with, if you've got to get up and go and switch it on, might be greater. 
um, yeah. and what you would find acceptable if, the, if it's being done for you. Yeah, and it probably depends on the, you know, lighting, a lot of lighting is really driven by the task, right? So if we're, you know, sipping a coffee somewhere, you know, that's fine. If we're, if we're doing open heart surgery, right, the task really drives the, the need for lighting. At the same time, I think what's really important, and we know this from psychology, is uh, perceived control, right? Nobody likes systems. Uh, and there are probably people that specify, um, auto, you know, lighting automation systems that they specify it in their day job. And then when they go home, they, they, they would never prefer that in their own, in their own context. Right. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. As far as like the context of, and, and the ta type task, um, and then also our willingness to accept the level of control. Right. So I think in most light, like this, I think this example is, is absolutely in like the, the typical kind of commercial or maybe university uh, office setting. Right. But I think it's really task dependent and context dependent. Yeah, Thank definitely. You. I, uh, in my office right here, the lights automatically come on and I have a giant window and I don't need it. <laughs> so it drives me crazy to have to go turn it off every, every time. So, yeah. Yeah. We have, uh, in, in our buildings, we have automatic lighting that that's very sensitive. If you sit for too long, not doing anything, it, it turns off and then you have to get really active. <laughs> suddenly in the middle of a call waving your hands around to uh, to get the lights to come on and um, thank you so much um for indulging my <laughs> slightly trivial questions there and um, I, I just i wonder as well it's it turning to the simulation side of things so um obviously there's a, there's a real question um when we're looking at schedules um uh, when we, we use a sort of standard deterministic approach, but actually um, whatever type of model we're using about what we're actually modeling um, and whether these, um, whether we're modeling temperatures or whether we're modeling set points and what's actually being delivered. And I wonder if you could, uh, if you'd say a few words about that. Yeah, so one of our co-authors um, and Julie, you might've been involved in this, but you know, effectively mapped some of the assumptions around schedules for uh, just occupancy schedules and uh, around building codes and standards across the world, right? And so I think that I get, the short answer is there's more work that needs to be done to validate the assumptions, right? Because I think even if you look at the disruption from COVID, right, how work is, if we're talking about commercial context, work has changed fundamentally, right, uh, particularly in commercial offices. So if we assume that everybody gets to work at 8.30 and uh, leaves at 5 and takes a one-hour lunch break at 12, you know, we're, we're already missing, we're 50% we're off, right, from the get-go. And so I think that, uh, of course, as researchers, it's a little bit understandable that we would say we need to do more research. But I think, I think that if you're a practitioner, there just needs to be a validation and a realization that, what you, what you might be using for a deterministic model at this point um, to get a sign off to proceed with a project might be different than the actual uh, approach that you would do if you actually wanted to predict the performance of the building. And I'm not suggesting that anybody likes to do twice as much work, but that just might be what we have to do until we can kind of validate and update some of those assumptions. At least that that's my, my take on it. Yeah, and just to add to that, something that I don't know if we explicitly said but something that i think so important to point out is um sometimes this research involves just actually talking to people and seeing what they actually do um i find a lot of assumptions being made based on previous data or previous buildings or whatever but um like one of the studies we're doing right now here is we're we're changing a few things about the building operation and to do that, we're talking to people about their comfort preferences and how many days a week do they work from home and what are their regular hours and and so on um, so that we can actually make those assumptions based on an actual um, request <laughs> or, or patterns of behavior and things like that. It's really apparent um, how much impact that's going to have on your on your simulation outcomes if, um, and how um, as we saw in one of the earlier webinars, the um, how codes uh, can really be so inadequate for for capturing the diversity of what's going on in the building stock. Um, in terms of uh, sort of 
new devices and, and the Internet of Things. Um, there's a question in the chat about um, whether, um, for example, machine learning can be used um, so we could see um, automated approaches that get a lot smarter. So we're not just talking about a fixed schedule or, or whether someone's actually there or not, but starting to learn about preferences as well. So do you think that, that which way would that tip the dial on energy consumption, yeah. do you think? Yeah, I was just I switched to this slide just because I was thinking about the Nest thermostat as as an example. I mean, to that question sort of aligns with um, this level of automation, right? And I, for me personally, I think it kind of depends on the user group and the context for if that will be accepted or not. Um, so that will be important, kind of that due diligence before you choose to select that, um, whether it would work or not. And Mikhail, yeah, did you have more to add? To yeah, that? I think the I think the 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 question is is on the right track, right? Which is absolutely it, it absolutely can be, and and uh, you know, uh, the learning approach is, is a great way to do it. I think to Julia's point, there are there are trust in the system issues, right? Where maybe in a commercial context, it's different. Like you know, we all if you uh, I absolutely when I come to work expect when I log into my computer that I don't think that somebody's watching my emails, but I know that when I'm in my work that somebody wanted to go through my work emails, they could. The minute I step into my home, it's a different context. I have a different expectation of privacy. So I think that to Julia's point, um, the assumptions around if people are going to kind of buy in versus buy not buy in is going to be a lot to do with the trust in the system. And you see that in other kind of automation context in manufacturing um, and, and not just in, in, in buildings. Um, so, again, we can look from, but I think the, the question's on the right track. Giving people the option to opt out too is important. And do you see um, those, I mean, this type of uh, thermostat obviously has the potential to, to generate huge data sets that um, aren't useful just for the manufacturers of those um, thermostats, but could be so useful for those of us in the building simulation field. Um, do you see any prospects of those data sets ever becoming public, um, being information that, that we could use um, for perhaps for programming other devices or just for for um, improving our simulations? Yeah, I, so I think they're, yeah, go ahead, Julia. Indeed. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think it's already being done. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's a Canadian, I won't call any manufacturers out by name, but there's a Canadian manufacturer that starts with an E that uh, is does a really good job with this, that they share that data. If you have a data MOU with them, particularly, I think they're just doing it with university researchers where you can um, have access to that data and use it, you know, obviously all anonymous. The other important, important point on that manufacturer is they, um, they prompt the users to ask if they want to provide this data and explain to them what the data use is going to be for, right? So they, they give it, they give the opt-in option to, to the, to, and, you know, some people who get these learning thermostats, they're motivated from, you know, altruistic values around the environment, right? So, but they do a good job of the buy in the other companies maybe that are larger market share that maybe start with a g um they are you can't get any of their data uh they keep it they keep that locked behind secret doors i mean even when we go to um you know conferences with and with them and they're presenting their they're the only people that their presentations are not uploaded to be shared with everybody right so so i think that it's it varies across the manufacturers I think it's a real shame um, that that's not more accessible, but uh, I guess it's the same across a lot of other fields. Um, thank you so much for that. I've really enjoyed that. Um, I think it would have been great to have had more audience participation, but we had uh, that was a, a great question. So thank you very much uh, to the attendee who who asked that. Thank you so much, um, Julia and Philip, for that. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, it, as always, these things make me question my practice in simulation and think a bit harder about it. Um, I will also think harder about the, the button on the toilet as well. <laughs> so, well, hopefully you sure. don't have to think about it, right? Like that's, that's well, the point. It, it should be something you don't have to think about. That yeah. should be our goal. That's the takeaway. I'm, 
I think I'm thinking about whether I'm thinking about it or not now. <laughs> that, that's probably the key thing. So um, I'll just finish by telling everybody a little bit about what's coming up next. So this is the penultimate one in our, this series on occupant centric simulation aided building design. And the final, um, the final one of these webinars is taking place next week and that's the design of sequences of operation for occupant centric controls um, with Barack Gune. So do use the QR code there to sign up for that um, if you haven't already and you'll also get a link in the email that you get after this session as well. Um, if you want to see any of the other webinars in the series or indeed any of the other series that we've been running you can have a look at our youtube channel the videos are all there i think we're now up to um, about 60 something videos this screenshot is a little bit out of date so um, do uh, like and subscribe and you'll get notified when new videos um, are added for each of these webinars so we're going to take a little bit of a break over the summer after this series, and then we'll be back in the autumn with a new series. But if you have any topics that you think would be really interesting um, for the community as a whole, then do please get in touch um, either by email or on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. And then finally, as always, uh, a little plug for joining IBIPSA as a supporting member. Uh, the supporting members are really important to IBIPSA because they do uh, fund the work of IBIPSA and in return uh, get a, either a print subscription or online access to the Journal of Building Performance Simulation and they get the right to use the IBIPSA supporting member logo. And as I always tell you, these are pre-COVID prices, so really very reasonable. Um, <laughs> Perhaps uh, you need to join now before the before the summer holidays um, to make sure you've got plenty to do on the beach. But uh, do consider uh, joining and find out more at ibipsa.org slash membership. Um, but that's all we've got time for just now. Thank you once again to Julia and Philip um, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.